Hey folks, uh, today we are out on top of Mosquito Ridge Road in southern Placer County and uh, on a bit of a treasure hunt. I'm joined today by mycologist and botanist Thea Chesney and we are standing up on the ridge top here surrounded by uh, Arctostaphylus viscida and some, what is it, Pinus attenuata, the knobcone pine. And, uh, but our real target today is Torea californica. Um, it is a spiny, needled, broad, uh, very large needled conifer. And on that conifer grows a rust fungus, which is uh, currently the subject of a study we want to help out with. So we're going to drive around a little bit and see if we can find some Torea. And uh, maybe we'll find some other mushrooms along the way. So, all right, here we go. So we got a very special treat for you. One of the first things we noticed just down from the ridge that we uh, were just standing on is a population of a rare manzanita. Um, this one is usually found more south than here, uh, down in El Dorado County, but this is the northernmost population here in Placer County. Uh, this is Arctostaphylus nisanana. Um, the Nisanon manzanita, I guess, would be a good common name for it. And so it's surrounded by other species. We've seen um, Arctostaphylus miwaka, and then this one right here is Arctostaphylus visita. So check out those, uh, those are the flowers forming. Those are called nascent inflorescences. But then if you look at the Nisanana, the nascent inflorescences are very, have these leafy bracts and like clusters of, of developing flowers. It's very different. Um, the leaves are covered in like a, almost like a peach fuzz compared to the very smooth leaves of the Miwaka and the um, Visida. And then most starkly noticeable is, check out the bark of this. Is that even coming out in film? It is just, there's no red. It's like this shaggy, brown, grayish bark. It actually doesn't have the character that the um, uh, that the manzanilla is most known for. You know, compare this to right here, the, the bark on the visita. You know, it's that typical smooth reddish bark that we come to expect with our manzanita. Well, not this species. It's got really dark, uh, dark colored bark and uh, Looking over this beautiful view here. And yeah, so this one's a rare ranked plant, ranked uh, 1B.2. Um, pretty much only known from the central Sierra. And we don't get too many rare species of manzanita around here, so um, absolutely a treat to see. All right, Theo, what do we got here? We are looking at a bolete in terms of form group and you won't be able to see why it's a bolete really until we get down to show you the underside but this is a very common bolete in our area the sierra foothills and actually very common all over california suilis tyrolescens and so that means the epithet means becoming blue so this is named for its blue staining reaction, which is actually fairly common in the bull eats. Let's see if I can get underneath here enough to show you the features that I need to, because, ah, there we go. This is a big boy. <laughs> wow. And you can see the pores underneath that are the uh, defining feature of the bull eats as a form group. So spongy tubes or pores rather than gills or spines or some other um, kind of fertile surface. But for Suilis chirulescens in particular, uh, it's a little hard to see because it's aged, but we have veil tissue that covered the pores when it was young and then has broken and receded and become um, pretty much a little bit gooey in age here um, on the stipe surface. And you can see around the edge of the cap here that it's retained its kind of white fibrous nature. So that veil, the, the fact that it's still white and fibrous up here, not yellow and gooey, is the one thing that separates Suilis chirulescens from its closest relative, Suilis ponderosus. 
Now, both Suillus ponderosus and Chirolescens are associated with Douglas fir. Now, what's the difference between a Suillus and a Bolete, or a Boletus? Right, so the, I used the term Bolete to refer to a form group of basically fleshy mushrooms that have pores. But what some people think of a Bolete as is more restricted to the family Boletaceae, or even the genus Boletus. The Suillus, it turns out, are in their own family, the Suillaceae, but that's not that important, really. In terms of what makes a Suillus, uh, it's got either veil tissue, like I pointed out earlier, or it has these sticky dots on the stipe surface, which this is not a great example of that. This species doesn't have so many of those dots. But that either, yeah, veil or sticky dots on the stipe surface, or both. And other genera of boletes with similar form group just don't have that resinous dot or glandular dot structure on the stipe surface at all. And most boletes don't have veils. So that's something that's not quite unique to Suillus, but it is, um, there are very few uh, bolete genera that have veils. So we're, ta if we're talking about other common boletes like the highly prized edible king and queen boletes that are in the genus Boletus, they don't have veils and their pores are actually much finer um, than the pores of this Suillus. That's another thing that a lot of Suillus have are very large pores. But Boletus um, is also kind of defined by the ornamentation on the stipe, on the stalk surface. So in Boletus, there's this finely fishnet-like uh, texture on a dry stipe surface. They're not slimy, at least not when they're fresh. That net-like uh, structure is called a reticulum or a reticulation. So that's a characteristic of Boletus and a few other genera in the Boletaceae, not Suillus. Um, another thing with Boletus in the restricted sense, this is something that you might hear uh, mycologists say sensu stricto or in the restricted sense, and that's because we've had a lot of name changes happening and a lot of these kind of classical genera becoming broken up into um, other, uh, into smaller genera. <laughs> that's kind of a, a pretty common phenomenon. So Boletus in the restricted sense in addition to the reticulate stipe surface, also has white flesh um, throughout the mushroom that doesn't stain any color. Um, uh, staining blue is fairly a fairly common reaction in bullets. And actually, ooh, you can see it right there on this Suillus, that blue right there, that's an oxidiza oxidation reaction of a particular acid that becomes blue when it's exposed. Yeah, you can see that blue right there. Uh, and despite the name, Suillus chirolescens, meaning, you know, becoming blue, the blue staining in this species is often fairly restricted and, you know, erratic, often concentrated very near the surface of the stipe and in the lower stipe here. So in other bullets, you may see the flesh becoming blue throughout. Like, there are some some bullets where they, the color change happens really, really quickly, and so by now this would be navy blue if it were one of those. But that's, I don't expect to see that kind of bluing in Suillus in general, uh, and not in Suillus chirolescens. Although, in places where this Suillus has been exposed to freezing temperatures, um, I've seen this in primarily uh, Oregon, uh, the whole cap can become blue. And so that's something that I don't see very often in California because most of the places that they're growing in the winter aren't getting regular freezing temperatures. But you can actually see a little bit of kind of greenish, olive green here in the cap, and that's probably a reaction to some cold and, and damage. So that's um, Suillus carry lessons. We've got old fruit bodies here, and then it looks like we may have a younger one hiding underneath. That would be kind of cool if it were in better shape. We'll see. Yeah, there we go. So you can see more of the white veil tissue on the surface of the stipe here, and that's um, nice to see that because it's 
that's the best way to tell this apart from the its close relative Sulis ponderosus. Although in most of California, apart from the north coast, I think Sulis carolescens is far more common than ponderosus. The cat being so pale here uh, is another thing that's if you see pictures, if you look up photos of Sulis carolescens, you will see a pretty wide range in kind of cap texture and color. Um, but it is within a defined range, and it's somewhat yellow, orangey to tan, and it can be somewhat scaly. You can see there's a little bit of texture on here that is kind of like these little darker brown fine scales. But unlike um, some other species of Swillis that have cap texture, this is it. This retains just a moderate amount of scaling, and it's the cap is kind of dry here. Um, not super slimy, but it is certainly a at least a little bit sticky because you see all this debris that's kind of clinging to it. So, um, kind of pale tannish to orangish caps, white veil, large pores that are a little bit what we call decurrent. They run down the stipe. They don't always do that in the Swiss, but they often do. And the you know white veil again um, over the kind of yellow stipe surface. Oh, and we've got some nice blue staining here showing. So yeah, um, the blue staining just coming with handling with damaging cells, damaging the tissue. So you get that reaction with oxygen. So, so I mentioned that Swillis are associated with the Douglas fir trees around here. But there's another mushroom that's hiding right next door to the Swillis. And that is also associated. So yeah, we got a couple caps here and there's a couple caps further up the hill. So this is a guild mushroom, as you can see, because we've approached it from this angle. And it's got some interesting black staining on it. It's also quite characteristic. I'm really having to dig for these because I really want to show you guys all the stipe surface and I managed to break that one so you didn't even get that. But it's also hard to get it out because it's really deeply rooted. So I'm going to try maybe again on another specimen here if it's not too old. Oh, and noticing here right by the Cerulis again, there's another Gomphidius hiding behind there. See, they're much more camouflaged than the Cerulis are um, just because they kind of have a beige to brownish um, cap that's got um, black stains developing on it. This one's older and it's rotten a bit at the bottom. But you can really see the black stains developing, which is a characteristic of Gomphidius as a genus. So Gomphidius, often called slime spikes um, for their shape, um, which is kind of like, almost like a railroad spike, where it's broadest at the cap and then it tapers down. And it, um, if you were able to get the whole stock out, you'd see kind of a rooting base. Um, yellow staining is often really characteristic. I expect to see bright yellow in the base of most Gomphidius stipes. Not all species, but this species, certainly. This is Gomphidius organensis, and it is thought to be parasitic on Swillis chirolescens here. It is definitely an obligate relationship, meaning that we never find Gomphidius organensis with a different Swillis or without a Swillis partner at all. So it's always found near Swillis. They may not be fruiting at the same time, but if you were to go back to that location, um, you would eventually see the Swillis if you found the Gomphidius. A lot of older references don't mention that, but look at that bright yellow. It's just absolutely glorious. Now, is that a natural color, that yellow, or does it stain yellow? It's not really a staining reaction. It is bright yellow innately. Um, so that, I mean, it's hard to tell because uh, this has kind of been damaged anyway. It looks like it's developing a little blue staining there, too, which is not actually documented from this species. But that can be a lesson to you that even though um, species aren't described as staining a certain color, it's often, you sometimes will find 
stains that don't match the description. It just, it just happens. Um, and we can go into why I am not surprised to see a blue staining reaction on this mushroom in particular. And that is because, um, genetically and microscopically, you can tell that Gomphidius are really, really, really closely related to Swillis, even though they have gills rather than pores. They are gilled boletes, essentially, gilled Swillis. So they are parasites on their cousins, basically. <laughs> but yeah, if you look at the spores of this Gomphidius under high magnification under microscope, you'll see that they look very, very similar in shape and form to Swillis and other bullied spores. They're kind of elongate and, um, yeah, just, um, they look the same. A lot of the microscopic structures will look the same. So, Gomphidius organensis here. This black stain on the edge of the gills here is probably due to drying. Um, a lot of mushrooms will develop darker stains on the gills as they dry, but all surfaces of the Gomphidius organensis in particular can stain black, including the cap down on the stipe, which is hard to tell apart from the dirt at this point, but yes, it does stain black. There's a little remnant of a gooey veil here. It's hard to see, but um, Gomphidius organensis has a gooey veil and that stains black in age. You can actually see the black stain veil pretty darn well, that black band on that stalk there, on that stipe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now that, this tall one, I'm not even going to pull out because it's so old, but it's got the classic Gomphidius kind of vase shape where it's got really decurrent gills. The gills run pretty far down the stipe, but it's kind of a, a trumpet shape or a vase shape overall. And that's absolutely classic for Gomphidius and a few other groups of mushrooms too. Very cool. Well, it seems like um, little tiny differences in color seem to be something that's really important yeah. about identifying fungi that you really need to note not only what color the mushroom is on the cap but on every part of the mushroom in Absolutely. order to tell them apart from other look-alikes. That's one thing that I think often trips people up in terms of identification. Um, when people are posting photos of mushrooms uh, it's very important that you show the mushroom from different angles as we've been talking about here just looking at the cap doesn't give you much information about what's underneath. We've talked about different kinds of fertile structures, so gills, and what the gills look like, how the gills are attached to the stalk, or if there are pores, how the pores are attached. In this one, I didn't even mention this before, the pores stain brown. It's kind of slowly, it's not super rapid, but all these brown stains have developed since I started handling this. So you got the blue staining reaction below, brown staining reaction on the pores. And that's another thing, sometimes people are afraid to pick up mushrooms because they might think, well, I don't know if it's toxic or not. Mushroom toxins are not absorbed through the skin in any meaningful amounts, so it's quite safe to handle uh, mushrooms, even poisonous mushrooms. The only exceptions to that would be uh, some people have an unfortunate... Um, dermatitis uh, kind of reaction, skin reaction to handling actually Suillus mushrooms, even though they're not toxic. So, you know, you can be unlucky, but that's a pretty rare reaction. It's not known from very many people. So, yeah. I think some people maybe while they're digging for mushrooms, brush up against poison oak and get yes. a reaction from poison oak and then mistake that for something caused I by the think mushroom. that's probably pretty common, much more common than actually reacting to the mushrooms. Yeah, especially because the poison oak has no leaves right now. You might right. not notice you're digging through it. <laughs> exactly. But certainly you're bound to get dirty hands oh, while yeah. working with mushrooms. Yeah. So if you don't like <laughs> getting dirty hands, maybe mushroom hunting not isn't for you. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And another thing that I was trying to show here, and I was able to show it with the Suillus. I wasn't able to show it with the Gomphidius so much, but it's very important if you're trying to identify an unknown mushroom that you come across that you dig down so that you can get all of the stipe not breaking it off um that's because some mushrooms have features at the base of the stipe that um, are important for identification and 
in Amanitas, for instance, there's a vulva or universal veil that um, is a defining characteristic. In the Swillis, as I mentioned, sometimes the base of the stipe is the only place where you can see the staining. I've seen um, people, if they're harvesting mushrooms for food, often will cut the stipe at ground level or even above ground level. And then this just happened this last week. Someone's like, well, it looks like Swillis carry lessons, but it's not staining blue. So how do I know what it is? And it's like, well, the part that would have told you that it's carry lessons via the blue staining, you left it in the ground. So yeah, if you're trying to identify a mushroom, get the whole thing, if at all possible. If you're, if you already know what you have and you're collecting for food, then you can pick however you want. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for ID purposes, the whole thing, uh, if you can at all. This over here I want to point to because this looks like a little rodent mound, maybe. But in the Sierra Nevada and all over California, mushrooms often hide under mounds like this. I don't even know how you notice that. <laughs> <laughs> My mushroom radar. I think, based on a few things that I can see, this is probably another Gomphidius organensis. I'm not convinced of that yet until I actually do some digging and find what's underneath the cap. But what we're seeing here, this white margin, is because the mushrooms actually split as it was growing. So it, the top of the cap is here, and then it's actually kind of peeled away to show the, the flesh of the cap a little bit. See if I can actually do what I told you you should do and dig down to get to the very base of the stipe of this mushroom. Very careful extraction required. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And sometimes it works better than others. <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> better. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it is the same. Yep, it is the same. You can see the yellow. You can see the decurrent smoky gray gills and kind of beige to staining black cap. So another Gumphidius organensis, just one that was completely buried and just pushing up a little shrump, as we say in the business. <laughs> now, as you're pulling up these mushrooms, are you doing any harm to the organism? Absolutely not. So that's one thing that another, a lot of people do also get concerned about when they're looking to pick mushrooms, maybe for food, maybe for identification. Like, am I harming the organism? No, you're not. So what we're seeing here are just the fruiting bodies of the organism that's underground and wrapped around the roots of the Douglas fir. We're just, it's, it is essentially a fruit. It's a sexual reproductive structure of the fungus. The actively growing part of the fungus is completely underground. And in the case of mushrooms that are mycorrhizal or associated with living trees, their mycelium, their actively growing, um, business end of the organism is very tightly wrapped around all the fine little root tips of the Douglas fir so or whichever tree um, is involved in the association so in this case I mentioned that the gumphidius is thought to be parasitic and it's certainly associated with the suillus so in this case the suillus mycelium is wrapped around the Douglas fir roots and then the Gomphidius mycelium is wrapped around the Swillus mycelium. <laughs> and it's probably quite extensive throughout this whole slope. Uh, why we're seeing mushrooms here is this, this was where the conditions were just right for the fruiting bodies to pop up. Maybe it's kind of the edge. Uh, we're kind of close to a road here. So it, it might be the furthest extent of the mycelium from one of these firs here that are behind us. Um, but yeah, um, it's all throughout the soil here. If you, if you dug with a shovel in here, you'd be turning over, goodness knows how many species of fungi. Um, and that's going to do much more damage 
um, to the organism potentially than picking the mushrooms that it, they produce. Very interesting. All right, well, why don't we go and see what else we can find while sure. we're out here? <laughs> Sounds like a plan. That's why we're out. We love to explore. We're looking here at a couple of different mushrooms that maybe you can see and maybe you can't. These are all kind of litter decomposers and uh, they're hiding here in the kind of combination of canyon live oak, black oak, ponderosa pine, probably dogwood and some other um, kinds of leaves. And the first one that I'm going to point out to you, it actually took us a longer time to find because it's so small and uh, kind of inconspicuous. But this is actually one of my favorite mushrooms, uh, just for its beauty. And you may or may not be able to see the color very well on camera, but it's got kind of creamy gills, contrasting with this deep maroon cap that's velvety in texture and a very tough, wiry, and polished maroon stipe. It's absolutely gorgeous, and a good example of a little guild mushroom. Its name is Merasmius plecachillus, and it's fairly widespread in California, um, and it's just really pretty. <laughs> it's, it's actually edible, and some people um, will collect it for food, when people do collect it for food, they don't tend to use the stipe because uh, it's so tough. And I can actually demonstrate the toughness of that right here. It's very, very difficult to break it. Um, it, it really feels like I'm holding like kind of an insulated wire. Um, and it, I can snap it, but it's, yeah, it's like got a lot of cartilage kind of going on in there. It's, it's a really tough mushroom, but a pretty one. And... Yeah, the, uh, the cap actually has a whole layer of specialized cells on it that cause that velvety appearance. Um, and they're basically cystidia, which are, is just a genera general name for uh, sterile cells that often stick out beyond the kind of main bed of cells. And the, those can occur on any part of the mushroom. In this case, they're on the cap. So very cool little merasmius and then another guild mushroom here is hiding way back in here right underneath the poison oak of course um luckily i'm not very allergic so <laughs> i'm not too worried but yeah one of the main hazards mushroom hunters face poison oak this here much more robust than the merasmius I'm going to be careful to dig all the way down so that I can get the whole stipe here. This is Cystoderma carcarius variety phallax, or just Cystoderma phallax. Another absolutely gorgeous mushroom that I love for its beauty. You can see that the lower stipe has this texture all over it. And that texture kind of continues up into this very flaring ring that's basically kind of like the skin that forms the outside of the stipe is just kind of peeling away. So this genus of mushroom, Cystoderma, has this very special different kind of veil. It is still considered a, a partial veil, technically, but it is really intergrown with the outer surface of the lower stipe. You can see how different the texture is in the upper side. It's very smooth and kind of um, fiberless looking um, and darker brown. doesn't have that same golden brown um, granular texture. You can see kind of little fringes along the cap margin. And th that's remnants from when this veil was attached up here when it was younger. These, this mushroom, as you might be able to guess, is white spored, but that doesn't, you know, spore color is not always easy to tell from gill color, but in this case, they're, yeah, creamy white gills, basically white spores. The cap texture, in this case, has been a little bit worn away in age, but it 
starts out as granular as the stipe texture. They really are kind of the same membrane going all around the mushroom, um, or at least the same texture. So there you have it, little Cystoderma phallax or Cystoderma carcarius phallax. And it's got a couple of little uh, residents in its gills. Um, just hanging out. That's very common. Uh, to have little insects and creatures hanging out in mushroom gills or under caps. You can also see that there's been a, kind of a, some bites taken out of the gills here. Um, and that's the little, little dings out of the gills might be from insect damage. The bigger ones are probably from slugs. Slugs absolutely love to chomp on mushrooms. So <laughs> you're not the only one going for edible mushrooms when you're out in the woods. You have some competition usually. <laughs> so. All right. So well, we were walking along this trail on this north facing slope, lots of mosses, lots of lichens, ferns, um, and down here underneath this rock overhang a little bit, surrounded by ferns, pentagramma triangularis, which you can see right here, and there's lichens and mosses above, there's this little mushroom that caught my eye, and wait till you see underneath of it. Not that not this is a characteristic of this species of mushroom necessarily, but this particular individual seems to have decided that it wants to grow an arm. And some mushrooms are more prone to this than others. That's not typical though. <laughs> it's just a little side cap. So cute. Here, let's get a close up of that. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, Don't mushrooms know how to grow? Not always. They don't read the field guides <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, um, this particular mushroom is a lactarius species, and those are so called because when you break their tissues, they usually produce latex. Now, in our dry climate, sometimes the latex doesn't really appear, but I'm going to try. Oh, yeah, there you go. I just ran my fingernail across to break the gills and you can see this white, almost like a heavy cream kind of consistency of latex came right out. And you notice that it came out white. Latex in different groups of lactaria species comes in different colors and also can have different staining reactions after being exposed to the air for a while. So this is in the group that uh, starts out with white latex and you know, we may or may not see depending on the species, um, that the latex slowly goes yellow. It's certainly not going yellow very quickly, but the speed of the staining reaction also depends a lot on which species we're talking about. So in a few minutes, we may or may not see um, some yellow developing. So this is in a group of lactarius that has the white latex and kind of generally orangish colors. Um, Lactarius, like their close relatives, Rusula, at least in North America and uh, the Northern Hemisphere, do not have veils on, so there's not, not going to be a ring on the stalk. There actually are some tropical species that have veils, which is really cool. But <laughs> around here, you're not going to find a Lactarius or a Rusula with any sort of veil. So the, the stipe, the stalk, is going to be naked, except when it has a little sidekick growing out of it, which is pretty unusual. Um, there are some mushrooms that characteristically have side branches and little uh, caps coming out of the sides of the stalk, but that's a pretty rare feature. Um, and little mutant things like this can happen pretty frequently in fungal fruit bodies um, because, among other reasons, as I mentioned, um, these are just fruiting bodies. They are not the organisms themselves. So there's a lot of room for plasticity, for different appearances, because fungal fruit bodies, mushrooms, are short-lived, they're ephemeral, and, you know, anything can happen. If you've ever grown fruit, you know that you can easily end up with deformed mutant apples, depending on what, how, much, how well things get pollinated, or, you know, anything can happen during the development that just throws it off a little bit and something different happens. So, um, in this case, it's, yeah, just decided 
why not grow another calf there? And I bet if you were able to zoom in far enough, uh, I can't even see it with my naked eye. I don't think it's really developed gills, but it looks like it is trying to differentiate its tissue in the, in the way that it would grow gills, just like the big cap. So, um, yeah, <laughs> funny, funny little um, cap, extra cap on mushrooms. But I think that the latex might be going very, very faintly yellow, but eh, I could go either way. It's, it's not convincing me yet. Um, and yellow is a really hard thing for um, cameras to pick up with the white balance thing, especially digital cameras. They just have a really hard time with yellow. My eyes sometimes have a little bit of a hard time with yellow, but usually they do better than my camera sensor. So <laughs> um, I can't put a name on it. This is in a group of lactarius that is pretty difficult to sort out. Um, the subgenus Rusularia, but small orange brown lactarius is a pretty good descriptor. The candy cap is a species that's relatively similar to this um, and is a very highly prized edible. It, however, you know, remember how I said maybe this is like heavy cream kind of consistency? The candy cap really has watery to maybe skim milk consistency latex. It's almost clear. So that's a difference. You can see right away, it, not candy cap. And the candy cap texture on the cap is also quite distinctive. This is smooth, a little bit greasy, almost sticky to the feel, and the candy caps will not be slimy or sticky. In fact, they'll be very finely bumpy, almost uh, kind of sandpapery or like the skin of an orange. So um, kind of similar colors, but a little bit more brown, not such bright orange. Um, just so you know, get a little primer on candy caps as well. But yeah, lactarius, the milk caps always a treat to find those in the woods. So we're looking here at some little kind of uh, shelf-like things that have gills. Um, this group of mushrooms is kind of commonly referred to as the pleurotoid mushrooms when they have gills like this. You can see the ones in my hand. Um, other things that can grow shelf-like include things with smooth undersides, with pores, but these are pretty darn closely related to other guild mushrooms, most other guild mushrooms at any rate, and um, they just have evolved this lifestyle where they don't grow a, a stipe, a stalk, they just attach directly to the wood or whatever they're growing on. Some things that look like this actually grow on mosses. Um, others can even grow just right on soil, but a lot of them do grow on wood. And these particular ones, um, you can start to see the gills that started out white. They are starting to turn a little bit brownish or even pinkish brown, um, which is due to the maturing spores here. So I believe these to be a Crepidotus uh, species, uh, but if the, if the uh, pinkish brown really does hold out more and stays truly pink brown, then we would be calling it more like uh, Clodopus something or other. But I think these are little just crepidotus, a very common group on uh, decaying wood of all kinds in the woods out here. So yep, uh, again, you can, if you aren't finding mushrooms around, you can uh, look at the undersides of logs. <laughs> Often a great place to find things when it's uh, too dry outside of that micro habitat. So what we're looking at here is basically a very reduced uh, fungal fruiting body. We call this form resupinate, or crest-like, um, when it's just attached to wood. It doesn't have any sort of flesh to it, it's just a layer of pores in this case. Uh, there are species that are like this that are toothed as well. And in this case we can actually see one of the things that a lot of uh, fungal fruiting bodies do, a lot of mushrooms do. Uh, which is called gutation. That's all the little droplets that you can see that are being exuded from the pore surface. You mean that's not rainwater? No, it's not rainwater. <laughs> um, it can be mistaken for rainwater when the liquid is clear, but uh, other species, not this one, uh, can often have colored droplets of liquid. Some of them are cherry red, some of them are bright orange or brown, um, or even purplish. So, 
Yeah, there is a lot to be learned still about what's in these droplets, but it does, it's thought uh, to be kind of a, a waste product that they're just uh, letting go of by um, letting it drip out uh, with water that they're sucking in too. So, so it's almost like mushroom urine. Yeah, kind of. Huh. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of an anonymous white crust uh, because crusts don't have so many visible features or so much to them. Uh, identification is definitely more of a challenge with crust fungi than it is with um, other forms. But uh, this is a thing that, that happens and they do persist um, often on the bottom of logs and wet drainages and even just under bark and so oftentimes you can go out looking for fungi in kind of not so great conditions and not find anything that has a cap and gills or cap and pores and stem, but it does, you can find um, things that are clinging to logs like this one. <laughs> so yeah, recipient fungi are um, the one of the less charismatic, but still very pretty groups of fungi, <laughs> fungal fruiting bodies. Again, they're, most of them might be considered decomposers, but not all of them. There are actually some mycorrhizal fungi, so those that are associated with living tree roots, that also form crusts. So um, just because it's growing on a log doesn't mean it's necessarily growing from that log. It can just be using that as a convenient surface on which to grow. And uh, logs and rotten wood in general is a really good moisture reservoir, so it, it can hold on to water a lot longer than the soil can in some cases. So that's why things that grow on rotten wood are often the first fungi to find in, in the fall when it starts raining or even before it starts raining. And they can be some of the last things you find in the spring as things are drying out too. Hmm, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't you tell us about what we got over here? All right, so you see this kind of disorganized mess of white threads. Well, I've talked about how fungal fruiting bodies are the, the mushrooms that we see, and even that last recipient crust that we saw. Um, but I've also mentioned, I think, the business end of the fungal organism. And that's something that we often can't see because it's in the, the soil underground or in logs running through the wood but here's an example where it's just kind of running on the outside of this dead branch and it's also organized into what we can call rhizomorphs which are basically mycelial threads with each individual piece of fungal hyphae or mycelium collectively is just a single cell thick way 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 thinner than a human hair so you can't see them when they're individuals. But in a lot of cases, especially with fungi that um, tend to have their mycelium grow through um, leaf litter and where they might be exposed to, to air and exposed to drying out, will bundle their mycelium together into these threads that get big enough that we can see them. Uh, and those are then kind of more efficient conduits and the cells on the inside are less likely to dry out or be damaged um, when they're all grouped together like that. So this spiderwebby, cobwebby stuff is actively growing fungal mycelium and I don't know what it's from <laughs> because mycelium is pretty hard to uh, identify. Pretty much need to sequence it to figure it out except in rare cases. And so you need to wait for it to produce its reproductive bodies, which yeah. are the mushrooms that we typically exactly. think about. Exactly, and that's one thing why mycology, one reason why mycology is a challenging science, because most of the fungal fruiting bodies are short-lived, they're ephemeral, but yet we can't identify them without the fruiting bodies in most cases. Until, I mean, the, the advent of genetic sequencing has changed that to some degree, uh, when it comes to mycorrhizal fungi being wrapped around the root tips of living trees, it's actually possible to take a sample from the fine root tip and sequence that and figure out which species of fungi are growing on that tree. But if you just have mycelium, you know, in the soil or on a log like this, 
it, you can't tell what it is just by looking at it. Even a microscope doesn't help because it's just a whole bunch of these filamentous, you know, cells, these long hair-like um, cells. So yeah, not that distinctive. So it's kind of like when we, um, with plants, how we need flowers in order to identify many plants because you actually need that reproductive organ, that, that distinctive reproductive organ to tell what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, that's actually a pretty fair analogy. We do need the reproductive structures, uh, the sexual reproductive structures, not the mycelium, which can often reproduce just clonally, asexually. So yeah, um, we need those, those fruit bodies, those mushrooms. And with that, we can move on to actually looking at another fruiting body. Isn't that cute? Those little yellow orange antlers. So this is one of the species that gets called jelly antler uh, sometimes. It's a little calocera. And it is actually soft, pliable, somewhat gelatinous. And um, it loves to grow on wet uh, wood. And you can actually see uh, some of these fruiting bodies are emerging from beetle holes. And I think that's just a little opportunistic use of an already existing pathway to emerge. So, yeah. So the mycelium is deep down in the wood. Absolutely. And then it's, it's uh, basically sensing that it's outside of the wood. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably hmm. one of the things that's triggering it to produce a fruiting body because it, yeah, it's getting that more airflow and yeah. It's... Now, are these technically um, corals or clubs or jellies? What form is this species? Well, this is where it gets a little tricky because <laughs> it is a coral kind of in form or the simpler ones you could say maybe club-like in form, but they're also jelly-like in texture. So, you are know, these official groups or no, are they artificial? These are completely artificial groupings. When we're talking see. form groups, um, they are totally artificial. Um, it's just based on what these things look like to us. So when we say um, coral and club fungi, there are clubs that are ascomycetes, so a totally different mode of spore production than the other corals and that's like the highest like once you have fungi you can break them first into ascomycetes or basidiomycetes so this jelly and everything that we've looked at um, today so far has been a basidiomycete but you can have things that look quite similar um, and would be considered in the same form group but are not um, closely related at all and, and so you need to look at it with a microscope to to really tell, at least until you get the hang of uh, knowing which which specific fungi are associated with that specific kind of spore right. production. Absolutely. Now, we talked a little bit about a milk cap, a lactarius, and we noted that that had gills, but it is not closely related to other gilled mushrooms. It is quite distant. It's in a different order, the Rusulales, and there are a lot of things that don't look anything like that that are more closely related to the milk cap than that milk cap is to any other um, gilled mushroom or the or the bull eats and also when talking about the suillus and the gomphidius earlier they are very closely related to one another even though they have different hymenium different uh, fertile surface structure the gomphidius has gills and the suillus has pores but they are cousins at least very closely related so yeah, back on to this little Colossera. Um, we do see these in the Sierra foothills pretty regularly in the wet season. Um, we, they are more abundant right after rains, like many of the jelly fungi. And the jelly fungi, is, um, to some degree, it's a natural grouping. There are ascomycete jellies and basidiomycete jellies, so there's a couple different groups, again, going on there that kind of look the same and behave similarly. But um, there is an actual order of jelly fungi, the Dacromycetales, and I believe the Colossera falls into that. So, very interesting stuff. <laughs> it's it's all interesting. Jellies are actually really interesting under the microscope, um, but they're beautiful too. And I hope that people can go out into the woods wherever they are after a rain 
jellies often respond really, really quickly to rain. And uh, just see what's bursting out of the logs and twigs and everything. Um, and so an example of one of the jellies would be like the witch's butter that we see yep, quite absolutely. often in the woods. That's a really common one. And there's a couple of different things that are orange and glob-like that get called witch's butter. Um, <laughs> oh, common grow, names. Grow on different kinds of wood. But yeah, absolutely. The witch's butter. There's a brown witch's butter as well, besides the orange one. There um black jelly drops a couple of different species that are completely black some bigger some smaller uh they're jelly ears auricularia that are um ear shaped and brown um and kind of fuzzy on top so yeah the wonders of jelly fungi they are pretty neat so here for the first time today we're looking at an ascomycete a very, very, very tiny ascomycete that is cup-shaped. And Shane's going to try and put his finger in there, and yep, yeah, that small. Um, <laughs> they are absolutely minuscule, so fungi come in all shapes and all sizes. Um, the fruiting bodies do, at least. <laughs> so these little itty itty bitty cups, again, are on, growing on wood, a relatively small diameter branch probably maple or another hardwood that's down in the drainage here and they're very very difficult to identify without um, microscopy um, even then they're quite hard even then they're quite hard <laughs> yes we could probably get them to family fairly easy getting them to genus would be trickier um, but another illustration of the diversity of forms of fungi and another thing that you can often find when larger mushrooms are not necessarily fruiting, um, as long as there's enough moisture, you can find these. So a lot of what we've done today is look in creek drainages uh, along slopes where more moisture is retained, and that is where we are finding mushrooms. So And it just goes to show you that fungi are everywhere. And uh, absolutely, you can find them pretty much all the time as long as you look closely and carefully. Yes indeed. <laughs> Always look for fungi. Never stop looking for fungi. That's my motto. I'm sticking to it. It's a great motto. <laughs> so we've found what we were looking for. This tree right here is Torea californica. Uh, it's the California Torea, California nutmeg. Um, it's a really interesting conifer. It, instead of cones, it produces these, uh, I think the technical term is an aril, so it looks like, um, almost like an acorn, like a green acorn. Um, but it is a conifer, not a flowering plant like oaks. And uh, you might confuse it with a dug fir or a true fir in the genus Abies. But uh, what you want to look for is these rather large needles that are held out um, in a single plane. And the branches are more, or, or less droopy than a dug fir. The bark, as you can see over here, is quite shaggy. It's a very large terea. And one, one trait that you can certainly turn to are the needles are very sharp on the end. You can see that little needle point right there. It will stick right in your, your skin there. So these are not fun to walk past because they will, they will stab you. But what we came here looking for the terea for is specifically a fungus that only grows on terea needles. And so if we flip this over, we can see, oh, maybe that's not a good example. Let's see if we can find one here. There we go. So you can see on the back of this needle here, we have these two little white lines, uh, and that's actually a rust fungus. And uh, this is a particularly interesting rust fungus, not only because it only grows on terea needles, but it's actually the, in, in layman's terms, it's the ancestor to all other rusts and uh, rusts are certainly fungi and so we're out here today to collect a couple of these needles and um, send them over to Purdue University where they're studying this species right now and hopefully that'll reveal a lot more information on the evolutionary history of rust. So very neat, we actually found it. So Terea is one of the two genera in the family Taxaceae uh, so it's not in Pinaceae, like our pines, um, or Cup Cupressiaceae, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, with our cypresses. Uh, Taxaceae has this terea, 
and also taxis, which you might know as the uh, yew tree, the California yew tree. And I uh, just also want to point out that, and I know you can't get this over video, but these just smell absolutely wonderful. They're extremely fragrant. They're gorgeous trees, um, very locally rare. You rarely come across them in our area and always a, a, a sight to see. Um, they have a really interesting distribution too. They're kind of spread out in um, the river canyons. And so you won't find them necessarily on the ridge tops, but you find them kind of middle elevation in the um, in the American River Canyon, uh, possibly in the Yuba River Canyon, and certainly in the River Canyons south of here, and also along the coast. So there you go, a crash course into Torreya. All right, well, that's going to do it for today's video. I want to extend a huge thank you to Thea Chesney for sharing her mycological knowledge with us. I hope you all learned something about fungi today, and, uh, you know, the fungi that grow all around, in, and on our native plants. I uh, hope you enjoyed seeing the Terea and the rare manzanitas. And uh, I want to ask you guys if you would like to, you could subscribe to the channel, get more information in the future, get more videos. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. You can join our Facebook forum where you can post your ID requests or your, uh, you know, if you're looking for help with your native gardens and uh, just generally, you know, get in contact with us. We want to hear from you. Thanks for watching.